Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Father, thank you for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Lord, some of us are dealing with the afflictions that Paul wrote about so far in this book. We are feeling boxed in, pressured, pressed in. But Father, you also give us the consolation and the hope. I pray, Father, for everyone who is gathered here in this place tonight and for uh, the many others who are tuning in online on their device, on the computer, or who will watch this in days to come. May your peace mark their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes a letter announcing to the church that is there why he decided to change his itinerary. We talked a little bit about that last week. So Paul's itinerary, Paul wanted, his plan, his idea was to leave Ephesus where he had spent three years doing ministry, go from Ephesus to Corinth, visit the Corinthian church, be a blessing to them, encourage them while they're there, then go up to Macedonia and visit the churches that were planted there, one in Thessalonica, one in Philippi, one in Berea, Apollonia, that area, and then go back down to Corinth a second time to bless them and encourage them yet again, and then from Corinth to sail all the way over to Judea, to be in Jerusalem to deliver that gift of that collection of money that he took from the Gentile churches. However, those were his plans, and we noted last week, if you want to make God laugh, make plans, because Paul's plans didn't pan out. And because they didn't pan out, the church that was anticipating that he would make good on his promise is a little bit miffed that Paul didn't show up like he said he would. Now, we find out that Paul went from Ephesus after a riot, went down to the city of Troas, and while he was there at Troas, uh, he was waiting for Titus. Uh, evidently, when Paul went and left Ephesus and went down to Troas, uh, he sent Titus with a letter to the Corinthians. And we believe that it is a separate letter, not 1 Corinthians, but probably what is called by scholars the severe letter. We told you about that a couple weeks in a row, the severe letter, something that was far more severe than 1 Corinthians even. And that Paul alludes to that in chapter 2, verse 4, where he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love of which I have so abundantly for you. So here's Paul. He sends Titus down to Corinth with this severe letter. Things don't pan out very well. He's waiting at, Tro uh, at Troas for Titus to come. Titus does not show up, it seems. And so he continues on with his plans. And his plans include going from Troas to Miletus, meeting with the Ephesian elders, Acts chapter 20, and from Miletus and meeting with the elders of Ephesus, and he moves on to Judea for the feast. But again, some of the Corinthians saw this as, well, we can't trust Paul. Paul says yes, but then he really means no. And so Paul had to defend his altering of the plans. And uh, we left off... Um, at the very end of chapter 2, though we did technically read through and finish chapter 2, I always like to bring you back for the sake of context a few verses. So notice in verse 12 of chapter 2, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, 
I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now, I'm guessing, once again, I mentioned this in passing last week, my guess is that this is when he went down to Troas and he met with the church and he was preaching all night long till midnight, it says. So he was a very, it was a long-winded sermon. And it was so long-winded that that young man by the name of Eutychus fell asleep in the window and he fell out of the window three stories down, hit the street, and the Bible says he was taken up dead. Well, that would interrupt Paul's sermon. So Paul kind of tells the people, hold that thought, a kid just got killed in the church service, goes down to the street, raises him from the dead, goes back upstairs and continues his sermon, get this, till the break of day. He had a lot to say in that. He knew he wasn't going to be there long, so it's like, you know, guys, I have an eight-week series, but I'm going to do it in one night. So he preached till midnight, a kid died, raised him from the dead, which would bring a lot of attention and a lot of interest, and probably that was the door that the Lord opened for Paul, this miraculous healing, and perhaps, probably, in that town, a revival. Now, look at verse 14 and kind of pick up that thought. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death, To death, to to the other, we are the aroma of life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? So, some of the Corinthians were miffed that Paul changed his plans. You can't trust him. He says yes, but he means no. He talks out of both sides of his mouth. If we can't trust this guy who says he's coming, how can we trust what he says? And so... What Paul basically brings it down to is, I know I said I was going to be there. The Lord changed my plans while I was on my way, so I did not end up coming to Corinth. But in the end, so what? In the end, who cares? Because God's got this thing covered, and I made my plans, but God revealed his plans, and so I always have to be flexible to God's plans. All of us have to say, if the Lord wills. If that's what God wants, that's what we will do. And that's exactly what James tells us, how we should live our lives. You should never say, we're going to do this or that, go to a city, buy, sell, get gain. But always we should say, if the Lord wills, we will do this and that. And Paul lived that way. And so he uses an analogy He says, God, he always causes us to triumph in Christ and diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Scholars will point out that Paul is referencing a ceremony that would take place in Rome called the Roman Triumph or the Roman Triumphal Procession. That is, uh, a general would be celebrated if the general had a victory over his enemies. And he would be celebrated by a a triumphal procession in Rome. That's the language that he uses. So, So get this picture. If you were a Roman commander, field commander, commander in chief, and you fought a battle, you won the battle. It wasn't just that you were quelling a riot, but you actually started a battle that you won, and the troops were now back home in Rome. If you had killed in that battle 5,000, at least 5,000 enemy combatants, and as a result of the battle, expanded Roman territory. So you took 
that area over for Rome after killing 5,000 soldiers. You expand the territory. Then when you get home, they would throw a huge party called a Roman triumph for you. The Roman triumph was a procession through the main corridor of town, the Roman Forum, and it would end at the Circus Maximus, this huge competitive sports facility. Now, in the Roman triumph, it would start out with some of the senators from the Roman Senate sort of marching at first. Then they would be flanked by Roman priests who would burn incense to give the sweet fragrance throughout the city. There would then be trumpeters who would make announcements. Behind them would be spoils of war, whatever was captured in the spoils of war from the battle. By the way, if you go to Rome, you can see a Roman triumph procession and an arch that was created when they won the battle for Jerusalem in 70 AD, when the temple fell. So there is an arch in Jerusalem. Rome, called the Arch of Titus. And if you look at the inside of the arch, you see something very interesting. You see the seven-branched candlestick that was in the temple, the menorah. You also see a depiction of the golden altar of incense that was in the temple, and the golden trumpets. They are drawn in motif on stone to this day, because Titus, the general, had a Roman triumph procession when he got back to Rome. So, in this Roman triumph, you'd have the spoils of war. Behind the spoils of war, you'd have prisoners of war. They would be chained. These are the soldiers that you, or usually the leaders, you killed a bunch of their soldiers, but these are the soldiers you captured. Uh, when the procession ends at the Circus Maximus, those prisoners of war are taken to the Colosseum where they would be killed or used for sport and then killed. And again, the incense that is being burned. Now, if you're a prisoner of war and you smell that incense, it's not a good smell because you know what's coming next <coughs> is coming next. So if you're a Roman soldier and you're the victor and you smell that incense, it's the savor of victory, man. It's the smell of victory. But if you are captured and you're a P-O-W and you smell that incense, it only means one thing. Your death is coming up very shortly. So it is the smell of death to you. That's the background that Paul is writing that with. So he uses this as a picture for ultimately Christ gets the triumph. Ultimately, God has a will. God changes our plans. In the end, Jesus is going to come back. And all those people that we lead to Christ are sort of like the, the trophies of war that we are bringing to, to glorify God. So thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death to death. And to the other, we are the aroma of life to life. So some will open their hearts and receive it, and your message, your ministry, is, is the smell of life to them. It's like, oh man, my life changed because you shared that truth of the gospel with me. But to others who reject the message, it's the smell of death. Smell of death. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So what he's trying to get their hearts and minds around is, look, I announce to you my plans, I told you in 1 Corinthians that it's if the Lord wills. Obviously, it wasn't the will of the Lord. But in the end, God gets the glory. Whether we march in triumph in the city of Corinth or we march in triumph in the city of Troas, wherever we go, God can use us to diffuse life to some and death to others. 
It's a really great way to view life. To have a light touch. And, and not to get all hung up if your plans or when your plans change. Like, ah, okay, let's see what God has. It actually makes life an adventure. Now, for some of you, it's more difficult. For others of us, it's exciting. When plans change, like, ooh, let's see what God has in store. For, for others, they just hate it when all the little details aren't exactly as they plan. Drives them nuts. They love control. But sometimes it's fun to just be on the ride and just sort of your, buckle, your seat belt's buckled in. Put your arms up. Take the fall and go, woohoo! Yeah, but you don't know where it's going to end up. I know, but in the will of God, who cares? It's going to be awesome. It's a really great way to live, to have a light touch with your plans, your script, so to speak. Years ago, in the Jesus Movement days, when at our church we started a little um, musical arm of Calvary Chapel that became something pretty well known during those years called Maranatha Music. And there were a lot of different bands that went out from the church for Maranatha music. Some of them were quite uh, well-known. Some of them were not well-known. I was in a band that was not well-known. But we would go to these little places around uh, California that asked for concerts, and they would call the church. So we would go out. One time we went out to this podunk town somewhere. I don't even remember where. Went into a church and set up. And they wanted a Maranatha band, and they knew the kind of music we played. But as we were setting up and practice, this, um, I remember this young pastor came up and said, drums are too loud. So we turned back to Jack, and we said, you know, Jack, you know, tone it down. So he, he toned it down a little bit. Kept playing, and goes, guitar is way too loud. So now this pastor was becoming the sound engineer. And basically telling us, I like this part, I don't like that part, don't do that, do this. And, and we, finally, we just had enough. And, you know, poor Jack was reduced to playing with brushes rather than drumsticks. Because the guy wanted to tone down so much, so, he, you know, we kind of said, look, you should have asked for a choir instead of our band. I mean, this is what you get when you ask for a Maranatha band. This is what we produce. And, you know, he, he then took a chair, a folding chair, uh, and because I'm 6'5", and he wanted to appear taller than all of us, he was a short little guy, and he took a chair, and he stood up on the seat of the chair and folded his arms so he could look down on us, and I'm God's authority, and this and that, and finally we said, you know what, you are God's authority, but we feel for us to play a concert in your church tonight would be a disservice to God, because... Uh, it, it would then bring people into your church, and we don't think it's a healthy environment. So we're not going to play tonight. He said, well, you, you said you were going to play. He said, yeah, but we didn't know we were going to have this. So uh, we decided to pack up, and we went down to a local park, plugged in. They let us use the electricity, just played for free out in the uh, green park, and just drew a crowd and shared the gospel and brought people into the kingdom. And we thought, okay, we didn't know it, but maybe that's what the Lord had in store for us. You know, let's just be flexible. And so Paul is trying to teach the Corinthians that. You know, you, 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 we, you may have to unplug every now and then and just go play in the park. And uh, so, but at the end, it's always a triumph parade. Uh, when you bring souls into the kingdom, whether they are in Troas or in Ephesus or in Miletus or in Macedonia or in Corinth. And, and now, he is, now he is edging in verse 17. He's edging into an area that sounds more like 1 Corinthians than 2 Corinthians. Remember I said 2 Corinthians was far more personal a letter 1 uh, Corinthians was more of a polemic. It was more of a, let me fix the problems. There are so many problems in this church. Well, there still were problems, but he's opening his heart in this letter. But now here in verse 17, he edges into that territory where he is kind of elbowing them, saying, yeah, but you still have these false teachers, or at least legalistic teachers, 
that are a part of your fellowship. And he seems to be kind of pointing in their direction when he says, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. The early church did have a problem. One of the problems, it's a blessing, but it became a problem, was there were so many itinerant traveling preachers. They would go from congregation to congregation. That's a blessing. The problem is you don't exactly know who they are. They didn't have social media. They didn't have computers. You couldn't look them up on Google and see what's been going on. You just get what you get, and you have to make an evaluation. Some itinerant ministers took advantage of this and, as people still do today on television and other means, used their ministry as a way to make a profit. They simply see it as a money-making business endeavor, peddling, as it were, the Word of God. It became, a pro- it became such a problem that a book was released. It is called, uh, referred to as the Didache. Usually it is mispronounced as the Didache or the Didache, but it's the Didache, it's the teaching of the 12 apostles. And there's a section in that little booklet, in that little writing, that tells the churches how to spot uh, a false teacher who comes through on an itinerant basis and what to look for and uh, when to kick them out, like if they beg for money or if they overstay their welcome, they stay too long. Or if they say, thus saith the Lord, cook a big meal, and you cook it, but then they eat of it, kick him out. He's a false prophet. Others can eat of it, but if he eats of it, you know, he's using the Spirit of God to enrich himself. So they, they had ways to regulate it. Paul is, is, uh, has this idea when he writes uh, this verse leading on into chapter 3. Now look at the word in verse 17 as of sincerity. I've told you this before, but it bears repeating. Our word sincere or sincerity comes from a Latin term, sinacera, which means literally without wax. So Paul is saying when we speak, we speak without wax. Now let me give you the background of that word because it's fascinating. In the Greco-Roman culture, you could get an artist to make a statue, or carve a bust, or a head, or a plate of some kind out of pure marble. And so a patron would pay for the money, the artist would make according to the specification, but let's say the artist has sculpted this magnificent statue of this man's wife, and he plans to give it to her on her birthday in their opulent backyard in Athens. And just when he is completing the statue and he's doing a a couple little chisel marks, let's say on the nose, to get that beautiful nose that she has just finely appointed and maybe even give her a little bit of a facelift in the marble to make her look really, really good. Let's say he's almost done, but the chisel slips or there is a weakness in the stone and the nose pops off. Now, months have been invested in that rock. Hours have been spent in making it just right. And now at the end, when it's ready to be presented, that flaw in the stone or that slip of the chisel and hammer, maybe a little bit too much pressure, has cracked off an ear or a nose or a finger. So they could, one, start all over again, more time, more expense, more cost to the artist, or the artist could cleverly disguise his mistake by taking dust, marble dust, embedding it in a wax substance and making a new nose and just putting it on so you couldn't tell the difference. But if her birthday was in July and it's 12 noon and going on to 1 o'clock and that statue is in the backyard in the hot sun and all of a sudden... You know, she's looking at it and saying, oh, I look so horrible. Because now that nose is starting to melt down the face, and it's obviously a, a, a problem. So it became such an issue that artists would stand behind their work by saying it is sinacera, 
is without wax. There are no substitutes here. I didn't fill in a crack or put a fake nose on. And Paul is saying, that's what we are. We're not, we're not, this is not just a show. And some people might have all show but no go. But when it gets really hot in the ministry and noses fall off and fingers fall off and you see the cracks, Paul says you can tell who the real ones are. That's the idea behind it. As of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. He continues, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need as some other, others epistles, that is letters of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Some of the Jews in Judea, in Jerusalem, would carry with them letters, parchments. Basically, a letter of recommendation of some important Jewish source so that when they went from synagogue to synagogue, or in this case from church to church, they could pull out the letter that would introduce them and hear some muckety-muck, some important person is saying, I endorse this person, I stand behind this person, you can trust this person. So Paul is saying, do we begin to commend ourselves? Do we need, as some others, letters of commendation to you or letters of recommendation from you? You, you Corinthians, you who are saved out of that pagan culture, your transformed lives in Corinth, you are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. You know, some people are like thermometers. They measure their importance by degrees. Oh, I have this degree and this theological degree, and I have the, the PhD degree and the Doctor of Ministry degree and the Doctor of Divinity degree. Cool, great. But Paul says, you know, we're the proof of our ministry is you. I can say, well, here's my degree. I graduated from this university. Or instead of measuring my importance by the degrees, the papers, the letters that I have, Paul says, I am measuring my importance by the fruit in your lives. There's a church in pagan Corinth. Your lives have been radically transformed. That's all the letter I need. People can see your life and read your life Known and read, I love this, by all men. And so are you. You are known and read by people in your family, people you work with, people in your neighborhood. Remember that little poem? You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day by the things that you do and by the words that you say. People hear what you say and watch what you do. So what is the gospel according to you? They were known and read by all men. You are manifestly an epistle, that is a letter, of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Now, Paul is taking you somewhere by this little analogy here. He is using an analogy of, we're not talking about writing something on stone, we're talking about writing something on the heart. Does that ring a bell to you? It should. It is an allusion to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, as opposed to the New Covenant, the New Testament. And it happens to be an allusion to an Old Testament reference. And the reference is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, where the prophet announces to Israel, the Jewish prophet announces to the Jewish nation that God is going to establish a new covenant. Not like the Old Covenant written in stone, on tablets of stone, but on the heart. He's going to write his law on your hearts. 
And he's doing that because Paul is going to compare the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Old Covenant of Moses with the New Testament, the New Covenant under Christ. Why? Because these teachers in Corinth had a Jewish background. They, were, they came from Jerusalem. We would typically refer to them as Judaizers. They, were, they thought it was very important to do uh, circumcision and keep the Jewish law. They've been around since, since Acts chapter 15. They've, they've, they've been a, a bother and a plague uh, to the church since way back when. It seems that those with a Jewish legalistic bent are the ones who are in Corinth talking to the Corinthians, dividing that church against Paul. So he brings out this allusion. You are manifestly a letter, an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. So God's written it on your heart. You are the living epistle, the living letter. People can see your transformed lives. That's all the endorsement we need. And verse 4, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Paul is saying, my qualification is not my skill set. My qualification is the power of the Holy Spirit operating in my life as seen in your lives because I led you to faith in Christ. You see, you see where he's going with this. That's the qualification. It's not that, that Paul is saying, I'm boasting, I'm bragging, because, you know, I have quite a resume. And I'm a very skilled person. And you know what? He could have. He was a very skilled and brilliant academic. You know that. He studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem a very notable Jewish scholar. And when he writes his letter to the Philippian church, I love what he says. He goes, oh, we are, um, um, the circumcision of the spirit who do not boast in the flesh, but in the spirit. Though I also might brag or boast, I have something to be confident in. If I wanted to be confident in the flesh, he said, I could be. If anyone else is confident, I could be more confident. And then he gives a little list of his background. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which comes from the law, blameless. He had an incredible academic pedigree. But then he says, but all those things that I once counted as gain, I now count as loss. For the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I might gain him, gain Christ. So his boast was in the Lord. He is boasting, but he is boasting not in himself, but he's boasting in the Lord. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, the new covenant, the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Now stop there for a moment and look at that once again. Not the letter, but the Spirit. That verse has been butchered and misquoted by groups for years with this interpretation. Well, you know, just plain, pure Bible study kills. You need the Spirit 
You need the free flow exercise of the Spirit. And, and people try to set up this false dichotomy between studying the Scripture, which they say is the letter of the law, and that produces death, that just kills, and the free-flowing worship, do whatever you feel in the moment, in the Spirit, that gives life. That borders on blasphemy. The letter that he is speaking of here is not Bible study as we know it, which Paul was all about, which James and John were all about, etc., etc. But it was the letter of the law in the Old Testament. That's the letter he's referring to, not the Word of God, not studying the Word of God, not sermons based on the Word of God as opposed to shandala, shandala, shandala. Uh, whatever you feel led to say or speak or flow in the Spirit, it was the letter of the law which kills. Paul said in Romans, the commandment which I thought would bring me life has actually brought me death. What is he referring to? The Old Testament law. So John uses the same analogy in uh, the Gospel of John. For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see the difference? That's the di same difference that Paul is alluding to here. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, notice what he calls the Old Testament, the ministry of death. Why? Again, Romans 7, the commandment which I thought would bring me life actually brought me death. I'll show you why in a moment. If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, remember God by himself, by his finger, wrote the Ten Commandments on stone. Moses brought them down the hill. If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, and it was, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now let me take you back. You don't have to turn there, but just take back in your memory to Exodus chapter 34. Moses is up on the mountain. This glorious, awe, awesome, striking movement of God was happening. Uh, the mountain looked like it was on fire. It was smoking. There was thunder. There was lightning. The children of Israel didn't want to go close. Moses was up there communing with God. God gives him the law. He writes it himself uh, in, the, in the tablets. And Moses comes down the mountain. When Moses comes down the mountain and they look at him, and Moses was unaware of this, his, Moses' face was glowing. And Aaron saw it, and the children of Israel, it says they were afraid to get, get close to Moses because it's like, the, the dude's like on fire. He's like, he's like glowing in the dark. A man is glowing. And so they were afraid. So Moses put a veil over his face. Presumably, he put the veil over his face so they wouldn't feel afraid to approach him. And then it says that he took the veil off when he went into the tent of the meeting and communed with the Lord face to face as a man speaks to his friend, then put the veil on and came out. But we're about to learn something that we didn't necessarily know from reading Exodus chapter 34. What we learn here is that the glow on Moses' face, which was miraculous, it wasn't long-lasting. It was fading away. It got less and less as the hours and days moved on. And that Moses actually covered his face because of that fact, because it was fading away. Now, why is that important? Because Paul is making a point like Moses' face that was a temporary glow and soon to fade away. So the law itself that God gave to Moses was temporary and fading away, predicted by an Old Testament prophet named Jeremiah. Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And now, Paul is saying, 
The Old Testament is done. It's over. God does not deal with mankind based on the Old Covenant any longer. The sacrifices would cease in the temple, even though Paul's still in that shoulder period. The temple was still going on in Jerusalem. Soon it wouldn't be. Uh, this is the end of the Old Covenant. So that's, that's where he's going with this. The face of Moses, um, because of the glory of his countenance, the glory was passing away. How will not the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious? For if the ministry, watch this, of condemnation had glory, and it did. Again, the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of death, that is the Old Testament law. Now, hold that thought. Why is it called ministry of condemnation? Because that's all it could do. It could only give you the standard that God demanded. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. But it didn't give you any power to keep that standard. The children of Israel said to Moses, uh, go find out what God wants and tell us we'll do everything he tells us to do. God's reply is, oh, that my people had such a heart within them. Even God realized it's impossible to keep the demands of the law. I appreciate their sentiment. I wish they had the heart and the ability to do it, but they do not. So at best, it was a standard that mankind could never fully keep. So it was the ministry of condemnation. It was the ministry that brought death. If the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So hold that thought. Listen to this thought in Romans chapter 8. Listen to this. It's familiar territory. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, that is the law of Moses, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So the Old Testament could not save. The law could not save. Listen, the law, the Old Testament pointed out wretchedness because it says you shall not covet. That is, if in your mind you say, man, I want a better wife, man, I want a better house, man, I want a better this, I want that, and you, that's a, that's a sin. You're, you're in your heart lusting after something. That, that's part of the Ten Commandments. So the Old Testament pointed out wretchedness, but the New Covenant produces righteousness. Huge difference. One only points out the flaws, the other produces righteousness. The Old Testament does not. The law is like a mirror. When you look in the mirror, you, according to James, you look full face in the mirror and you see your natural self. Usually... I could almost guarantee it. When you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, you decide you need to make some changes to what you see there in the mirror. Am I right? A comb, a brush, makeup, it could be anything. You are going to alter what you see because the mirror conveys your true condition, but it lacks the power to change your condition. You can't say, mirror, mirror, on the wall, fix me up and... I'll be tall, or whatever. You, you couldn't do that. The mirror reveals the condition. It does not fix the condition. A level's the same way, or a plumb line before a level was introduced in architecture. It could tell you if the building was off or on plane, off kilt. It could not rectify the situation. Here's another analogy. Let's say you had a glass of water, and you put dirt in it and you let it set and you left it alone, eventually the dirt is going to settle down to the bottom. 
And you could look in the glass after it settles and you could say, well, it looks clean to me. It looks great to me. Um, and you might just be deceived and think, I, I can drink it. I'll be refreshed by it. But there's dirt in it. If you take a spoon and stir it up, it reveals the true condition of the contents of that glass. The law of Moses is the spoon. It stirs up what's really inside and reveals the true condition. Oh, we can get settled here and there and look really good from time to time, but the law comes along and we're slayed by it. It reveals the true condition, but it can't fix that condition. So he's talking about the ministry of condemnation, death, versus the ministry of justification, God declaring us righteous. Or if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness succeeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For what if it, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. The law was a covenant that would point out people's condemnation and sin. According to Paul in Galatians, it led us to Christ. It pointed the way to Christ. It pointed us to the way to, place to get it all fixed. But it did not have the power in and of itself to fix us. Unlike Moses, verse 13, who put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Their minds were hardened, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. He's saying, why would you go back to a pattern, a covenant, an economy that is temporary? The law was temporary. It served its purpose. Again, Paul is in that shoulder season, that overlapping between Old and New Testament. Soon the temple would be destroyed. Soon there would be no Jewish sacrifices. And up to this day, there are no sacrifices in any temple for sin. The old covenant has passed away. The veil of the temple has been ripped in two. The temple has been destroyed. But their minds were hardened. Until this day, verse 14, the same veil... Now, he said Moses wore a veil, but he's speaking now of a spiritual veil on the hearts. The same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Paul knew about that veil. Paul had that veil. Paul listened to the testimony of Stephen in the synagogue in Jerusalem. And they, the, the people who stoned him laid the, the, their, their jackets and their robes at the feet of Saul, who was overseeing it, and Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. Paul had a zeal in his heart against Christians. He went to Damascus against Christians. And later on, he regrets it. He looks back and he says, I have a zeal in my heart for my own people. I wish that I were accursed from Christ for the sake of my Jewish brethren. And then he says, for they have a zeal that is not according to righteousness. Because they... Uh, ignore God's righteousness, and they seek their own righteousness, which they can never produce on their own. And so Paul knew what it was like to have a veil when uh, they, they study the Old Testament Scripture. To this day, I marvel. I go to Jerusalem a lot. I've been there 41 times. When I go to the Western Wall and I see the ardent worship and prayers, and they move and they sway, and they see, they're 
they seem so sincere, but they're blinded. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And it's heartbreaking because you see the religious fervor that they have, and they mean it. But Paul says there's a veil. When they read the Old Testament, um, they read Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, that, that plainly foretells uh, the, the coming of Christ and the suffering of Christ. But to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And that's exactly what happens. Ask any Jewish convert. This is how I used to interpret it. This is now my eyes have been opened. This is how I see it. It's so plain to me. It's so obvious. And one day, the Bible predicts all Israel will be saved. When the nations come against Jerusalem in the last days, in that area known as Har Megiddon, Armageddon, and God miraculously preserves the Jewish nation. Although some will be affected, many the ones who remain will look upon him whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his own son, and they, they will turn to the Lord, and Paul predicts Israel will be saved. But nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The veil is taken away in Christ. Why is the veil taken away in Christ? Because the Old Testament scripture that they are blind to speak of Christ. Remember what Jesus said to the religious leaders? You search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. You're reading the Bible, you're studying the nuance, and you think that, that doing that will give you life. But you ignore the fact that these scriptures speak all of me. The typologies in the law, in the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the temple, the prophets, all speak of me. And when Jesus rose from the dead on the road to Emmaus, he met with two disciples. And it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all things in the law, in the Psalms, and the prophets that speak of him. Because he said, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered and enter into his glory? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Why? Because they all speak of him. And when you put Christ in the middle of that enigmatic Old Testament passage, it makes sense. It's cleared up. The veil is taken away in Christ. And the Lord is spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, we all, with unveiled face, remember the veil is taken away in Christ, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of God. Now, the word that he uses here for transformed in the last verse of chapter 3 is the word metamorphosis. It speaks of the larva being changed into a pupa, being changed into a fully mature butterfly. It's a beautiful description of the Christian. The Christian is a caterpillar becoming a butterfly transformed. We are instantly transformed in our relationship to God the moment we give our lives to Christ, and then we are continually being transformed the more and more and more we gaze upon the Lord in the Scripture, in the Word of God. There's a great story by Nathaniel Hawthorne. You probably recognize the old man in the mountain. The old face in the mountain. And it's a story about a little village high up in altitude, just underneath a mountain. And on the mountain, uh, carved into the mountain, or seemingly carved, was the face of a, of a man looking down, kind of solemnly, sternly looking down at the people in the village. Well, there was a legend attached to that, according to this story of Hawthorne. 
that one day somebody would come who looks like the face in the mountain. And he would come to that village and bring great blessing and make transformative changes to that village. And that legend got the uh, imagination of one little boy that was raised in the village, and he would go out every day and stare at that face in the mountain and just imagine what it's going to be like when that man comes who looks like that guy. And he, he just would, his imagination would run wild. Well, the little boy in that village grew up to be a teenager and from a teenager to a young man, but he still loved that story and would contemplate looking up at that face. And then that uh, teenager became a young man, as I said, then a middle-aged man, then an old man. But he still loved that story, loved that idea. But one day, he was walking through the village. And somebody said to him, hey, you're the guy that we've been waiting for. You look just like that face in the mountain. And the story is that the man, the boy, and eventually the man, became like what he was contemplating. And you know, whatever you behold is what you become. Whatever you look at is what you turn into. Some of you get so distracted every day by looking at that little device, you just can't get rid of that dopamine fix of looking at that and just looking and looking and, and minutes turn into hours well, you, you, you become what you behold. If you look at filth, you become what you behold. But if you gaze upon Christ and look to him and behold his glory and spend time with him, you become like what you behold. So, we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The law can only point you to Christ. Christ can take you to maturity. Christ can take you to salvation. And so look to Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.